President Volodymyr Zelensky says he's open to negotiating a potential neutral status for his country. In an interview with several independent Russian news organizations, which the Kremlin banned from publication inside Russia, Zelensky said his team was carefully studying Moscow's demand for Ukrainian neutrality. He said that the issue would have to be put to a referendum. It comes as the Ukrainian intelligence service warns that Russia is trying to split the country in two. After more than a month of fighting, Kyiv remains in Ukrainian hands, though increasingly scarred by war. But even those whose homes have been destroyed believe that victory is possible with enough help. Everything depends on how our Western friends help us. We will win if we get lots of help. We will win soon. As it struggles to make advances on the ground, Russia has ramped up its bombardments. Much of Kharkiv, just 50 kilometers from the Russian border, already lies in ruins. It was Ukraine's second largest city. Now half of its residents have fled. Thousands of those who remain have taken refuge in underground train stations, hiding from Russia's heavy shelling. In the besieged city of Mariupol, the situation is even more dire. Food and water are scarce, and locals say they've had to bury their dead in makeshift graves. Ukraine's president is carefully considering how to best end the suffering. Volodymyr Zelensky said his team was studying Russia's demand for Ukrainian neutrality and that the issue would have to be put to a referendum. Security guarantees and neutrality, non-nuclear status of our country. We are ready to go for it. That's the most important point. It was the main point for the Russian Federation. That's why they started this war. On Sunday, Ukrainian authorities said an agreement had been reached with Russia on a humanitarian corridor out of Mariupol, giving residents the chance to try and reach safety. Those who do make it out may well join the ever-growing number of refugees, like these crossing into Romania via ferry. And for the latest on Ukraine, we're joined by DW correspondent Fanny Vichar in the western city of Lviv. Fanny, President Zelensky is now talking about a potential neutral status for Ukraine in exchange for security guarantees. Uh, would any guarantees from Moscow be credible, though? That's a really good question, Nick, given the situation here on the ground and all what Ukraine has been through since February 24th. All the bombardments across the east and the southern, but also northern parts of Ukraine and also here in Lviv just uh, a couple of days ago. So difficult to answer, but also if we just look back on history, there's the Minsk agreement in 2014, which was supposed to bring an end to the war in the Donbas region. That did not happen. That Minsk agreement was signed by Russia. It was signed by Ukraine. But this is where realpolitik is on the ground right now. Instead of bringing peace to Donbas, this escalated even further with this full-scale invasion of February 24th. President Zelensky, from his perspective, says there's only going to be peace if Russian forces withdraw. The question is just how far. Uh, that wasn't really clarified because he actually said they should withdraw to where they were. Now, this could be only the Donbas region, but he also made clear there's not going to be peace without a ceasefire. So a lot of things that are quite catchy. And even if for us journalists, it's so difficult to translate what the uh, actual uh, deal breaker would be here. Just imagine how hard it, it will be for these two uh, negotiation teams, the delegations of Russia and Ukraine, to actually come to terms to something that they then can put forward to their audiences, which is Ukraine here and Russia uh, in the neighboring country. Uh, and you were mentioning the Donbass region and those Minsk agreements and the negotiations that broke down. They were seen as a way towards peace. Um, could that be a way out of the war? Is sacrificing the Donbass seen as potentially the way forward? President Zelensky, in that 90-minute interview that he had with Russian journalists, he made clear that he's not going to basically force uh, to a force bill retake all Russian-occupied territories. Now, the largest chunk of that is the Donbas region. Having said that, it clearly implies that he may would want to 
have a compromise over that uh, uh, region, which is a very difficult question. He said actually in that interview how that compromise is going to be reached, but he's putting it out there as a way to find a way around all of this and to bring an end to the war. Because what he underlined in that interview as well, he wants to decrease that there's more a bloodshed, that there are more casualties, and that this war is is prolonged by such uh, by, by by more months, more weeks to come. So yes, it is definitely a central point here, the Donbas region. But the question really is whether people will accept that. President Zelensky in Ukrainian, in a different interview designed for the Ukrainian audience, said yesterday that he definitely wants to have a referendum about anything that may uh, bring a change to uh, the territory here. And he also said that he wants to prioritize the territorial integrity of Ukraine. So a lot of conflicting messages there, if you ask me. We will have to see what these peace talks will bring that are supposed to start today in Turkey. Okay, DW's Fanny Pichar in Lviv. Thanks so much. And after a month of war now, many have been surprised at the strength of Ukraine's defense. But the human cost of the conflict remains high, with a number of both military and civilian casualties growing by the day. And amid the destruction, people are having to bury their friends and family in the most difficult of circumstances. DW correspondent Amin Asif sent us this story on a slain soldier from a small village close to the Polish border. A house fallen silent. He was just 20 years old, hit by Russian artillery on day three of the war. It took weeks for his family to learn of his death and bring him home. People from all around came to Dimitro's funeral to honor him. He was a true Cossack, and he smiled a lot. He was funny, artistic. He always wanted to help everyone. He loved us all so much. He wanted to keep this family together. We'll remember him as an amazing person an amazing brother. The Vasutas are a military family. Dimitro's sister said their father is considered by many a hero of the Donbass conflict. It seemed natural that her brother would choose the same path. Dimitro's schoolhouse. His teacher received the news of his death with a mixture of pain and pride. We saw each other other for the last time on the 12th of February, and he said, OK, goodbye, we'll never see each other again. And I said to him, you can't say that. I ask if his death has scared any of the young men in the village who may one day have to face the front lines. Absolutely not. It will give them more courage and strength, maybe even make them angry enough to take on such a responsibility. Nobody is afraid. It's no longer 2014. There's a completely different feeling. In Western Ukraine, we've always seen military service as a responsibility. A duty is a duty. A lesson instilled at a young age here. Theirs is not to reason why. The cemetery where Dimitro is buried. His grave is visible from a distance, and it seems as if it's the very center of the town. A tragedy, but piled high with flowers. And more than half of Ukraine's children have been displaced by the war, with huge implications for their ed development and education. Some Ukrainian teachers are trying to keep up the school routine, using the internet to teach children scattered across Europe. We met a young school girl who fled to Germany, but is still attending classes run from back home in Ukraine. It's eight o'clock in the western German city of Bonn. The first lesson of the day is starting for Nastya Habar. It's an online lesson. Normally, she would be in Kyiv at her school right now. But at the beginning of March, she had to flee Ukraine together with her family because of the war. It is quite important to stay in touch with teachers and classmates. We all need that in this situation. That way, we get to see how all of us are doing. That way, everyone knows that I'm doing well. Today, Olena Trotz is giving the lesson. Before the war began, they could all be at school together. 
Now, most of her classmates are scattered all over Europe. That's why Olena teaches them digitally. She's still in Kyiv. It's dangerous to stay at home. But teaching the children distracts me from the reality we live in. I would like to close my eyes and wake up in another life. But unfortunately, that is not possible. Nastya, along with her sister and mother, has been placed with a host family in Germany. This gives them security for the time being. Nevertheless, like thousands of Ukrainian children, the kids are now missing important lessons at school. That's why they'll soon be enrolled in Germany. Until then, online lessons help them. I do exercises with them. I paint with them. We carve and glue. We make all kinds of artwork. This gives them strength. It gives them courage and also confidence for the future. Thanks for doing the shopping today. We need lots of things for the party. Nastya is in Germany. Her classmates in Poland, the Czech Republic and Slovenia. But her teacher manages to reach them all.